In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, dear Christian friends and, and family, uh, <laughs> right before the uh, service started, I had a member look at the sermon title for this morning, and uh, uh, by his response, uh, I, I could see he was going straight to the Second Amendment. I assure you, uh, this morning's sermon is not about uh, Florida's stand your ground uh, kind of a law. This is, this is not about, uh, about guns. That, we'll keep that for the politics. But we will go back to Ephesians chapter uh, 6, and uh, we'll talk about what the Apostle Paul, what the Word of God uh, says about you. Just in summary, um, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, so that you can take your stand against the devil and his evil schemes. Put on the full armor of God, so you can take your stand. Uh, That's God's word in summary for this morning. Uh, How many of you have been watching the Olympics uh, uh, throughout all of it? uh, America had the largest delegation, well over 500 athletes. Athletes that have been preparing for just this moment in uh, arguably uh, the, some of the, uh, the world's best training facilities. They have the best of uh, uh, training and equipment and even with their uniforms and everything, and it's all done so that they can compete against the competition. The competition, I mean, um, whatever is across the net, whatever is uh, in the lane next to you as a swimmer, or as a, a runner, um, to, to beat them and to finally uh, win the victory. And I, so I look at Ephesians chapter 6, and, and it's telling you, put on this equipment, this armor of God. And I thought, oh, uh, how, uh, it, it wasn't lost on me, you know, that tomorrow is back to school. And so there are teachers, and there are all these students, and they're, they're getting ready, back to, to battle, so to speak, right, for a, another school year. Kids are, are just getting ready, and, you know, here this morning, we got to, our special guests are the, the Small Steps uh, Academy, uh, all of the staff that, that are gathered here for this morning, and you can only imagine what it's going to be like from their vantage point, that the battle that they are going into tomorrow, one, 145 backpacked or diaper bagged kids coming on in with all of their needs. Are they, are they ready like those athletes in Rio? They come into the competition and, uh, and, and they're ready. And, and then I thought, you know, just yesterday I, I received a, a news, um, a classmate of mine who also graduated Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, same, uh, same time, Greg Bitter, I always remember him. And uh, then uh, yesterday got the news, uh, he suffered just an unexpected massive heart attack and, and he died. You know, someone who's my age, three children and a wife. And then I look at Ephesians chapter 6 and, and I ask my, myself, it made me think, you know, am I, am I ready? Are, are you ready? Ephesians chapter 6, the, 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 God, the maker of the heavens, the shaper of the earth, realizes the battle that lies before you. you know, and that's why we're here this morning. Christianity is a religion that realizes life is a fight. There is not one inch of your life that is either claimed or counterclaimed by God or by your enemies. So, are you ready? We're going to look at some word of God that offers to you some state-of-the-art equipment. And how ironic that we're doing it right here. Because, yes, it may be true that our Savior's Lutheran Church is a Pokemon gym. But it's also true that this is a state-of-the-art facility where we get ready, we get trained with the equipment that God gives us in this battle because ultimately it's only with this equipment that Jesus gives to us that we even stand a chance of surviving all the way to the end of life so that we can stand on the podium and, and be winners 
of eternal life. So the Apostle Paul would like to address you, and he says, let's get you ready. Because with that equipment, Christians are, you're armed and you are dangerous. So we're going to take a look and say, well, then who is our enemy? We're going to identify the enemy. And then we're going to hear God's word that says, stand your ground. And then we're going to hear his promise of, of winning the war. Um, Nashville-based research, uh, LifeWay research, uh, just this past year they did um, a study of thousands of Americas just because they wanted to kind of in a way take the spiritual temperature of Americans, the ones that were sitting in the pews, but then also the ones that were on the street. They wanted to see what exactly is the pulse when it comes to uh, what people are believing today. And in short, it, it was really interesting because it's Americans, uh, they, they know the basics. They're able to identify the basics. It's just that um, Americans get a little fuzzy when it starts getting to uh, the details about what they believe. Americans would like to have this kind of, we believe in God, but it's this kind of quasi christianish God. Uh, and, and they want a, a cafeteria style doctrine. You know, where you could just go through the feeding line and then you get to pick and choose what you want to believe based upon your personal preference. But what else was interesting is when, when Americans are asked very specifics about, about those hard details about what is biblical truth. See, that's usually when, w w that became very difficult for them. So, for example, when it came to uh, matters about faith, 71% uh, of Americans believe that they must do something to, in, in order to be a part of their salvation. Almost three out of four Americans believe they got to do something. Or two-thirds of Americans say, um, God will stay uh, off in the distance from you um, until after, and only until after um, you, you know, you give him the go-ahead to come and, and work faith in your heart. That's a, and that's a little bit of that American rugged individualism, you know, kind of a, a pick your, yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of a religion, which then means uh, it, it doesn't look at faith as being a response uh, to the grace of God. I took note of that. The other thing I took note of is, what are Americans believing about heaven or hell? Um, remarkably, over two-thirds of Americans believe in heaven, and you're not going to believe this, but all Americans think that they're going there. Then, uh, remarkably, 61% of Americans believe that heaven is a real place, but you know what I'm going to say. Nobody thinks that they're going. In other words, um, heaven is a real place, and yet Americans are like, well, but it all depends upon what you got to do in order to get there. But when it comes to hell, no, see, that, that's for the really, really uh, uh, bad people. And it's almost as if, uh, because of that, nobody really thinks of, of, of the devil. It's, that, when it comes to evil, no one is thinking about Satan or about him. It's almost, you know what, it's almost as if there's a close sign on hell, Satan died, and nobody knows about it. Almost as if hell has, has lost its heat. Which means then, if uh, there is no devil, and there is really, we, we don't have to take seriously this whole uh, location that's called hell, well then, then what do you attribute evil to? And Americans like to think that evil can, is something that you can solve. Um, evil is more because of natural uh, causes. So, for example, um, um, that person is evil. Well, it's, it's because uh, they, were, they were brought up the wrong way. Or they didn't have uh, uh, the same advantages as other people did. It was part of uh, maybe their uh, education. And so uh, evil then becomes something that's very psychological. It's something that's sociological. And, and uh, you can't really blame them because then that would be very critical. You, you'd be judgmental of other people. And so if you asked America, well, then what's behind evil? They will, America will just study it to death. 
and think that it's natural causes. And then they'll think that, you know, this is something that we can fix. We can fix cruelty. We can fix, uh, we can fix racism. We can fix the violence of the world uh, because it's all due to natural causes. What else was interesting is how Americans view sin. And only one out of five Americans believe that um, uh, if you sin, you know, the, the little ones, they don't count anymore. It's only the really, really bad sins that uh, truly get God's uh, attention. And that's the only reason why, if there is a, a, a bad place that is called hell, it's only for those really bad people. So overall, uh, Americans aren't worried about sin anymore. And hell has kind of lost its fury. And evil, well, we, we, just, are, we just have to fix ourselves. And so I, I guess when I read something like that, it, it kind of wears me thin after a while. And, and, and then I think to myself, well, then what's behind evil? And then what is the root cause behind all evil? Has anyone asked God lately what he thinks? Has anyone wanted to survey him and his words to say what he would say? I'd like to share with you just a comment that Jesus uh, uh, said about this. And he said in Luke chapter 10, 18, Jesus said this. He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. In other words, Jesus said, I was there and I saw the supernatural forces of, of evil. I was right there. It's interesting, you go anywhere in the world today and many cultures and nations, they understand and they believe um, in the spiritual forces of good and evil. Only Americans are, are kind of of the kind that, that don't believe it. They say that it's kind of natural or, or it's scientific, which, which when you think about that, um, is it possible then, if, if we deny the reality of Satan, is it possible that maybe we are becoming a little bit simplistic in our thinking? Are we the ones that are a little naive? Do, do Americans really believe that we've cornered the market on wisdom and therefore no one is, is as wise as we are? Because if it's true, if what the Bible says is true, and, and it is true then all of a sudden there is such a reality that is called supernatural good and it's supernatural evil. And then here you are, human, the natural one, up against something that is supernatural. Do you really think that on your own power then you're going to be able to defeat the forces of evil that are supernatural? If you think so, then I would think, then start looking at yourself as a kid with a BB gun going up against a tank. It's not going to work. And then you get why the Apostle Paul talks about putting on the full armor of God. Uh, Satan has his allies. He has his resources. He's got his portfolio of, of what it's going to take to bring you down, to invade your life. And that's what Paul is saying um, when he writes this. He says, our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood. But it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and uh, against the spiritual forces of evil that are in the heavenly realms. It, it's possible to underestimate the supernatural forces of, of, of evil and think that there is no struggle that is involved there. And that's our struggle, Paul says. You can take it seriously or you don't have to. It, it's interesting when, the, when Paul says, our struggle is against. That, that's a word that's referring to literally um, w when you're wrestling. There, there are two opponents that are on the, either the wrestling match and, and, and on the mat and, and they're, they're wrestling away for the gold title. Or back in the Apostle Paul's day, it, that was a military, that was a warfare terminology. You're in battle. And it's one thing for uh, cruise missiles to, to strike. That's part of warfare, right? Um, you could have a gun in your hand, M16. That's part of warfare too. Uh, but it's when enemy combatants get so close that the bombs aren't working, you, the guns don't work anymore, and you are in hand-to-hand -hand combat. When, when you, you have an enemy that wants to kill you, and you are on the ground, and you are wrestling to keep the knife away from your body, that's the reality of life 
and of death. And that's the word Paul says when he says, you know what our real struggle is? Our struggle is not flesh and blood. Our struggle is against the spiritual forces and powers of darkness and the forces of evil. I, I wonder sometimes if we, if Christians can err or non-Christians can err on two sides. On one side, um, Christians can say everything that they do wrong, well, that's because of the devil. In other words, I, I let my temper get in the way. I got angry. Well, the devil made me do it. Really? Or is it possible that, that uh, you're angry because inside your heart, you're just, you're refusing to forgive someone, you know? So to, to say that there's some kind of a demonic influence uh, upon. Or on the other hand, an unbeliever, Americans can take this whole, uh, the, the spiritual idea of devil and evil and, and just totally dismiss it and say it's not even worth believing. See, I wonder if those are the weapons of Satan. He gets us uh, so overly um, committed to his influence, or we don't take, we take for granted the power of his influence in people's lives. See? And so you could be in the middle of a battle and you don't even know it. A, a shot is right at your head and you don't duck. You get into an argument and you don't even realize what the influences are behind you. Or we get suckered into thinking that our flesh and blood relationships as if the other person, they're the ones who are your opponent. In other words, failing to see what is behind the attack that you're going through. It's not everybody else. It's a devil attack. We, we think that the, that, the, that the only way the devil can really be involved in human life is... is uh, if a person turns green, you know, and they start vomiting, you know, and their head starts twisting around without failing to see how subtle the influence is that he can use. He's the real opponent. Your opponent in life with that hard to get along with person, it's not that person. Behind it all is someone who's trying to get you to disobey your God, his rules, to take for granted uh, the love and the forgiveness that, that God has given to you. And you can see it in the way that we even try to excuse and justify our own sins, right? So we can say, oh, I'm not greedy. I'm just thrifty. Yeah. Oh, I'm not nosy. I'm just really concerned about that other person. You know, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just a social person. The influences that the devil has on us. And those tricks, without even knowing it, can get you, you, you can get suckered to be on his side, and then all of a sudden you don't even realize you're putting your signature on a contract that belongs to him. See, what is going to prevent that, the Apostle Paul says? How can you go through life without getting suckered? Paul writes, then put on the full armor of God. That's his whole premise for Ephesians chapter 6. You know, what good are your car keys if you're sitting uh, behind the steering wheel and they're on the kitchen counter? If you would never be caught leaving your house without any clothes on and going, walking through Port Orange, then how in the world would you go through life with a half-dressed faith? or without putting on the, the words of God. Going into a competition with the equipment, Paul says, put on the full armor of God, because Satan is going to try to continue to tempt you. He's going to try to crush you with guilt on one side, or he's going to try to take away uh, the freedom and assurance that is found in, in Christ. Put on, really, when we talk about knowing your enemy, then also know your weapons. Uh, we went through it with the kids. All of those weapons, and if you're going to put them all together, uh, they were the, the, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. You, you put it, put, sum it all up in one word, you know what your weapon is? It's, it's the gospel. The gospel which is not your righteousness, picking yourself up by your bootstraps. It's, it's Christ's righteousness. The, the word righteousness, I, I know that it means uh, to be right with God, but the word righteousness also has the idea of living up to specifications. You know, when, when you match yourself up, uh, how, how do you look and how do you match up in someone else's eyes? Pretend that you're going... 
you're going out on a date. You really like this other person. And as you're going out on your first date, what do you do to get ready, you know, to, to prepare? Isn't it amazing how oftentimes we will get ourselves ready by trying to cover our flaws? And, and so we'll, we'll wear clothes that hide as best as possible uh, our flaws. We'll remember the kind of personality that we have. And if we know that, that we're an over-talker, you know, we'll, we'll keep reminding ourselves, no, don't, don't talk too much. You know, it's, why? Be- because we're, we're trying to make ourselves look right. We're trying to hide our flaws. Is that possible to do before God? Then go back to Psalm 139 that you're saying and you find out uh, you, you can, there's not a place that you can go in heaven on our earth that will get you away from the presence and the understanding and the sight of God. You see, there's, there, there, are only two, there are only two kinds of people who are here this morning. There is a kind that says, yes, I I believe in God and I need to live a good life and I need to measure up to his specifications in order to be right with him for my eternal salvation. There's that group. And then there is the other group that says, that says, if I'm going to be right with Christ and with my God, then the only way that's going to happen is if God gives me his righteousness and totally clothes me with all that Christ has done for me. Jesus was the one who was ripped apart limb from limb for the sin that has already ripped you apart. Jesus is the one that fulfilled what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might be covered with his righteousness. See, to put on Christ is then to be picking up the sword of, of, of the spirit that the Apostle Paul talked about. He said the word, of, and the verse of the day this morning said, the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's just that sometimes we try to go through life and, and we get dull and we forget to sharpen our swords. And that's the reason why you are here in the state of the art training facility to to take your sword, to get your faith, to sharpen it up with that word of God. Because with that word of God, now you are armed and you are dangerous. And then go ahead and tell the devil, yeah, try to tempt me with guilt. If the devil ever tempts you to feel guilty, then this is what you, you say back at him. You say, then you go to my debt payer. His name is Christ. You take it up with him. He's fully covered me. You don't have to go through life feeling guilty and ashamed. Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, height or depth or anything in all of creation will ever be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You're covered. You're armed. You're dangerous. Amen.